Now, and I want to start with the matter at hand. That, of course, is the debt ceiling uh, and, a, and a looming apparent uh, deal here. Uh, Kevin McCarthy says it's going to be on the floor next week. Then it becomes a question of passage, of course, Senator, and it appears he will need some Democratic votes. Can you tell our listeners and viewers where are your red lines on this? Well, first, one thing to remember is uh, I'm proud to be the independent Senate from Arizona, and so I'm yes, happy indeed. to join you all today. Um, I actually don't tend to talk in terms of red lines, and in fact, um, I think that when folks come around and start talking about red lines, um, that's how you tend to not get to a deal. So what we've got to do is really focus on coming together to find areas of shared agreement. The default, the possibility of default, is a threat to every single one of us in this nation, regardless of whether they're a Democrat, Republican or an independent. So our goal here has to be about solving the challenge and doing it together. Now, if you ask me about what should I think we do about the debt limit and default, yeah. the bottom line is that both political parties are guilty of playing fire um, when it comes to the debt limit. When either party is in the minority, they demand requirements from the other party in order to get to a deal. And unfortunately, that's been happening for years, and it's a mistake. It's wrong. We should never play with fire when it comes to the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Now, here we well, are Senator today. Mm -hmm. We know that you have had a long history of relationships with some of the key players in these negotiations, a long working relationship with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, with Steve Reschetti, who is negotiating uh, on the side of the White House, as well as the OMB director, Shalonda Young. So what are you telling them directly? Yeah. How have you been involved in these conversations? Well, the good news is that we've now got the right people in the room to have the conversation and come to an agreement. And I am beginning to feel more and more confident each day that such an agreement will occur. We've got some really good news here. One is that Kevin McCarthy has said over and over he doesn't want to have a default. His folks are in the room negotiating to prevent a default and solve this challenge. Steve Reschetti and I have negotiated many a deal together in the past several years, and he's a good voice for the president. And Shalonda Young, she's the smartest person in the building. She knows the budget and appropriations inside out. So with those folks at the table, I feel confident that they're going to come to an agreement and that we'll be able to stave off default and get back to the business of governing our country. Your confidence is refreshing, uh, Senator. There, there are a lot of questions right now about work requirements. This seems to be where a lot of the action is in the negotiating room here, and, and I wonder where your line is. President Biden says he's open to additional work requirements for programs like SNAP, but draws the line at Medicaid. Do you agree with him? It's funny because you keep mentioning the word line. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, when folks put up red lines, it makes it harder to solve the problem, not easier. The reality is in our country, we've long had modest work requirements for some mm. entitlement programs. And continuing those makes relevant sense. The conversation about whether or not we'll have fewer or more of those in the future is really a discussion that belongs in the negotiating room, not on television but cameras. If ultimately, if ultimately that is included Included in the package. Senator, would you still vote yes to that deal? I like how you guys keep trying to come back to the red line question. And I'll just tell you right here and now, I'm not going to answer it. But I am happy to talk about how I think we can move forward after this conversation to prevent a future situation like this one. In fact, I just introduced a bill with Senator Ernst that would ensure that Congress gets accurate, nonpartisan information every year about the true facts around the fiscal state of our nation. That way, as members of Congress and senators, we're all informed about what our financial situation is like. And then rather than playing politics and playing fire with the full faith and credit of the United States of America, perhaps we might choose to get serious about fiscal discipline and taking care of the fiscal health of our nation. Senator, you had a long list of questions today for uh, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve, Michael Barr, in a Senate Banking Committee hearing, looking into uh, the causes and the fallout from the, the bank collapses that we've witnessed over the past couple of months here. Uh, um, among your questions, it really got to authority, oversight, supervision here. And I wonder if at this point, following your conversation with Michael Barr today, you're satisfied with the Fed exercising its full authority, or does Congress need to mandate something here? 
Well, it's been clear from the last two times that Vice Chair um, Barr has testified in the Banking Committee that he's acknowledged two things. One, that the agency did have sufficient authority to provide oversight and failed to do so appropriately. Today, he talked about making internal changes around the culture of his organization. And as you heard in my questions, I've encouraged him to create a detailed plan and report it quarterly to Congress so that he's accountable to us for actually implementing that plan. But one thing that we know is clear, the agency, the Fed, had the authority and chose not to exercise it over SVB and other banks that have faced failures. And that is a failure on their part. So as you saw today, I've encouraged them and tell them that we expect them to actually do their job and do it at the speed of business. One thing we've learned is that the Fed was too slow in responding to elements or signs of risk. They would ask questions of the bank, but didn't hold them accountable and didn't do so in real time. That's something they need to do is modernize so they can actually respond to these threats in real time, just like we as consumers respond to the threats or challenges we face in real time. So, Senator, that's something you'd like to see the regulators do internally, but is there anything you'd like to see Congress do legislatively? Are there any measures, bills that you would support to address the banking crisis? There are a number of pieces of legislation that we've introduced in a bipartisan way, including legislation that would claw back the executive bonuses and other inappropriately taken income on the part of these executives. But in terms of regulation, let's be clear, the Fed and FDIC have said they do have the regulatory powers to prevent further bank failures and to hold banks accountable. It's their job to do it. It's Congress's job to hold them accountable and ensure they do it. Senator Kerry Lake has been in town this week. She's made her second visit here uh, this week, uh, this year, I should say, talking with the NRSC. Uh, Ruben Gallego has been talking about you a lot in the media. And I wonder if you can tell us what your timeline is for making a decision on a potential run for re-election. I don't have anything to offer to you on that point. As you can tell, I am 100% invested and focused on doing the work for Arizona in the United States Senate right now. As I say, politics can wait to another day, but right now we have so many challenges on our plate. Arizonans can count on me to stay 100% focused on meeting those challenges. But as you do your work in the Senate and look towards your future, can you rule out caucusing with the Republican Party? Well, I've asked, been asked and answered that question numerous times. And as I said just about a week and a half ago, you don't leave one broken party to join another. Arizonans and Americans across this country are hungry for leaders who are not invested in one party or the other and who don't march to the drum when they're told to do something and who, importantly, are willing to get out of those partisan boxes and solve the challenges we face in our country. I've demonstrated to Arizonans over the last 20 years of service that I can be that person and have been that person. And I know they can count on me to continue doing that work. So folks can count on me to be the same independent voice I've always been. I have to ask you about uh, an important issue for your state, and I know it's something that you take very personally, Senator, and that's what's happening at our southern border. You're up with uh, a bipartisan bill to extend Title 42. That was just rescinded. Are you getting support in that effort in the Senate? Well, I'm so glad you've asked about this because it's the number one issue on Arizonans' mind right now. When the administration ended Title 42 without an appropriate plan in place, once again, the burden falls on the shoulders of Arizona's border communities. And of course, this is a growing humanitarian crisis for the migrants themselves. So Senator Tillis and I have introduced a bill to extend the elements of Title 42 so that the administration can do what it should have done over the last two years, which is prepare for the end of this program. We are growing in support and have gathered six co-sponsors of both political parties because people all across the country are seeing what's happening in states like Arizona and Texas. They see migrants coming to their own states in the interior and they know that this system is broken. It's time for us to give more opportunity for the administration to prepare for the end of Title 42. In the meantime, Senator Tillis and I are continuing to work on our bipartisan framework in a bicameral way to actually address the deeper causes that are creating this problem. So securing well, our border, solving I'm our broken asylum the system, the addressing the our visa issues, and continuing to work to solve this in a bipartisan and bicameral way. 
On the subject of it being bicameral, of course, ahead of the end of Title 42, we did see an immigration measure passing uh, in the House. They called it the Secured the Border Act. Are there parts of that you could get on board with? Where is the opportunity here for, for compromise? Well, it was an important step forward that House Republicans passed a border security package. There are parts of that package that are very useful and some parts that aren't very practical or helpful. But what's important is that there was movement. We haven't seen movement in a bicameral way in over 20 years in Congress on immigration. So this was an important first step. Now, it'll be no surprise when I tell you that I've been working with my colleagues in the House for months as they were developing this legislation and we're continuing to work together as the Senate will create a bipartisan package to overlay and make changes to their piece of legislation and to add in elements that are important like asylum reform, visa issues and our dreamers. So we have work to do but I'm heartened by the fact that they're moving forward. In our remaining moment here, Senator, President Biden has taken fire from both sides of the aisle on this issue of the border. What does he not understand about this? Well, I invite President Biden and Vice President Harris to come actually visit the Arizona-Mexico border. If they were to do so, like many of my colleagues have joined me in recent months, they'll see the devastation, not just to our border communities, but to the migrants and those families themselves. The reality is the system is broken, and we need both enforcement on the part of the administration and changes on the part of Congress to fix the law and solve this problem once and for all.